Hey everyone, my name is Elisa. Welcome back to my channel, Thrills and Stitches. If you've been here before, you know what I'm all about. I'm creating my dream wardrobe from scratch and I'm taking you along for the ride so maybe you can recreate some of the pieces that I make at home. Usually my videos are all about creating garments and pieces that I love from scratch. I share with you how I create my patterns and where I draw my inspiration from and I share with you the entire sewing journey from beginning to end. However, I was wondering how can I help those of you out there who are really at the very, 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 very very, very beginning of their sewing journey and have no clue what's going on. You don't know how to thread a sewing machine, you don't know right from wrong side of a fabric, you don't know what a fold is or center front or center back, you don't know the terminology of it all, you also don't know where to start looking for learning resources, maybe also don't know where to get your inspiration from or what a good piece would be for you to start your sewing journey. And this is what this video is going to be about today. I'm going to talk about everything that you need to know to really start sewing. We're going to start with sewing machines, how to thread them, how to name different pieces on a sewing machine. We are also going to talk about terminology of fabrics, of pattern construction, of seams, what kind of seams are there. We are also going to talk about inspiration and learning resources, as I've just mentioned. I'm going to share with you the ones that I really like for myself, and I'm going to pack this all in a concise and relatively short video, so let's start. Let's start with what you will really need to start sewing. And by that, I mean what you will really need. So quite obviously, the first thing you want to be looking out for is a sewing machine. Now, there are so many different sewing machines out there. There are different sewing machine brands out there. When I started sewing again, which was about three years ago now, I just bought myself a very, very cheap, very basic sewing machine. It was not computerized, very, very basic model with just a few different stitches, but that was enough for me to start sewing. I believe I bought it for 70 pounds, but if you are looking for something even cheaper than that, I'm sure there are secondhand options that you can look out for, which will just do fine for you. Once I started my YouTube channel, I leveled up a bit and I got myself another sewing machine also by Brother. It's a computerized sewing machine and it's out of their Innovis line. It has several different stitches. It sets itself to the base stitch every time when you turn it on and off and I'm going to show you a little bit more about that. In addition, I also got a serger or an overlocker which I use to serge or overlock my seams. More about that later. What you will also need is a pair of scissors. You want to be sure that you have a pair of scissors for your fabric and you have a separate pair of scissors for paper when you cut your patterns for example because if you use your fabric scissors for paper, you're gonna dull them out and they're not gonna be as sharp anymore and you don't want that. A seam ripper, especially in the beginning, is gonna be your best friend. You're probably going to make a lot of mistakes, especially in the beginning, so be sure to have a good one at your side. You will also need some chalk to mark on your fabric, which is removable. There are also removable fabric pens, which I can really recommend. Other things you will need are dressmaking pins. These are very, very important because they will help you to keep the separate pieces of your garments together when you want to sew a seam. You will need a tape measure to take your measurements. And most importantly, you will also need several kinds of different threads to start out. Maybe you want to start with the primary colors plus black and white, so you cover all your bases. Okay, so we have all of our basic tools that we need. Now we want to start sewing, but how? Let's set up our sewing machine. Every sewing machine works slightly differently, but there are a few things that they all have in common. First, you need to make sure it's plugged in and that your foot pedal is plugged in as well. Once all of that is done, you can turn it on. This is a computerized sewing machine, which means it comes with a few handy goodies. For example, every time I turn it on, it will automatically change all settings to default factory settings, depending on the stitch I have selected. This machine also allows me to regulate the sewing speed with this sliding button. I can change the end and starting position of my needle, which means it either stops with the needle in the garment or out of it. So in this case, it would always stop sewing with the needle in the garment, which is handy for corners, and set like this, it would always stop with the needle lifted, which is the default position. And this is the back stitch button, quite important, which allows you to lock the beginning and the end of your seams. For many machines, the backstitching option is controlled by a lever which you can find on the side of your machine. With this rotary button, I can choose the kind of stitch I need. So for example, a straight stitch, a zigzag stitch, a blanket stitch, or a buttonhole stitch, which not all machines have available. 
Your machine most of the time has a secret drawer built in, which often holds things like sewing foots, needles and screwdrivers that come with the machine. Alright, let's thread our machine. So first, grab sewing thread and pop it onto your sewing cone holder. This can either lie down like this one or be in an upright position. Once that's done, we can wind our bobbin. The bobbin holds the second, which is the bottom thread, that combined with the top thread we just placed will create your seam. The bobbin goes into its little case in this area of the machine. A machine can either be a top loading or a front loading machine, which means the bobbin case is either in your sewing table looking down on it or in your sewing table looking at it from the front. So to wind the bobbin, follow the instructions which you can usually find on your machine. Generally speaking, the way to do it is to place it onto the little pole on the top right of your sewing machine. Press it down. Next, grab your thread and guide it through first a little hook, which most sewing machines have, and then through the round disc, which is going to ensure your bobbin winds with an even tension. Guide the thread further to your bobbin, wind it around a couple of times and cut off the excess. Now, press your bobbin together with the pole over to the right until you hear it click. Press gentle on your foot pedal until you see the bobbin turn. Once the bobbin is full, push the pole back over to the left, pull the bobbin off the pole and cut the thread. Now you have to place the bobbin in its case. Again, this is a top loading machine and while yours might be a front loading machine, the principle is the same. You also might have some thorough descriptions next to your bobbin case which you can follow. First, pop the lid of the case. Grab your bobbin. When you look at it from the front, make sure the thread unwinds counterclockwise. Don't put it in with the thread coming off in a clockwise direction, as this could result in a seam not to build, or worse, a jam. Put the bobbin in the case and guide the thread through the slits you can see here. The thread will get caught between tension discs, which you cannot so much see, but might be able to hear. Cut off the excess. Now let's finish by threading the top thread. A trick to follow here is to think that you always thread in a reversed end shape. You go down, up and down again towards the left. The important thing is to ensure that your thread is caught by the hook on the inside of your machine's head. You can pull it up by hand to be able to see it better. Just guide the thread around the hook and it should catch hold. From here, Guide your thread downwards towards your needle. Make sure the thread is caught by the hook over your needle. The last thing to do is to thread it through your needle eye. With a basic machine, you have to do this by hand. Many machines, however, and so mine, have an automated needle threader, which is quite handy. You can use it to thread your needle with the use of a lever on the side. Before you start sewing, make sure your thread is guided through under your presser foot and towards the back. You can now manually make one stitch by using the rotary button on the side of your machine to pull your bobbin thread up. And that's it! Let's talk about the terminology of sewing. Let's start at the very beginning. If you sew two pieces of fabric together with a simple straight stitch, you have a seam. The seam keeps those two fabric pieces together and makes sure they're not coming apart. You can sew a seam with different kinds of stitches. A seam can be straight or curved, it can be zigzag, it can have a corner. A seam can look and come in various different sizes and shapes. As I mentioned earlier, if you want to make sure your seam is not coming apart, you want to lock the beginning and the end of it. You do that by back stitching on your machine. A fabric has a good or a right side and a wrong or a left side. What I mean by that is that the front side of your fabric, the side that you want to face outside, is the good or the right side. The inside of your fabric, the side that you want your body to face, is the wrong or the left side. Usually it's quite easy to identify the wrong and the right side, but sometimes if you have a plain fabric, for example a linen or a cotton, it is not so obvious, so you might have to take a closer look. If you have something with a print on it, for example the silk shirt that I'm wearing right now, it's quite obvious what the right and the wrong side is. Generally when sewing a seam, you want to make sure that the good sides, so the two right sides of the fabric, are facing each other. So when you open up the seam, the beautiful flat seam is on the outside and the raw fraying edges of the seam are on the inside of the garment. 
Let's talk about raw edges and fraying edges. When you cut a fabric, it usually starts fraying after some time. To avoid this, what you can do is to use a blanket stitch on your machine or buy an overlock or a serger and search off the raw edges of your inside of your garment. Something else that's gonna be on the inside of your garment are seam allowances. So to sew a seam, you want to make sure there is just a little bit of extra fabric on the inside so your seam doesn't unravel or open. And this is called seam allowance. Usually with most garments, you will work with a seam allowance of 1.5 to 2 centimeters. If you need it to be less than that, you cut it back after sewing the seam. So let's talk about darts. Darts are simply triangular wedges that you sew off of your pattern piece to make the garment better fitting. You see this very often in blouses, especially around the bust area for women, but you also see it in the backside of blouses or dresses, for example. Darts are very, very important in dressmaking, so you want to be sure to understand their functionality and why they're there. So let's talk about fabric. So when you buy fabric, you usually buy it by the yards or by the meter off a roll. On the roll, usually, you will have a double layer of fabric that you buy by the yards or by the meter. And this double layer of fabric is joined together by a fold. So when you open it up, it's even wider than what you might see in the beginning. The inside of that fold is usually the wrong side of the fabric. The good side of the fabric is usually facing outside so the buyer can see what the pattern or the color actually looks like. When we cut our pattern pieces, we usually cut them on the folded together double-sided piece of fabric because our pattern standard is usually just half of our body. So we will have to cut two of most of our pattern pieces. The fold on the fabric that you bought is very, very handy and you usually want to use that for either your center front piece or your center back piece or both of them because this is a very good indicator later on in the sewing process. Now, I just mentioned the two terms, center front and center back. They are quite self-explanatory, but they're also very important to keep in mind. So your center front is obviously the center front of your body and the center back is the center back of your body. Very often we either have a closed center front and an open center back because this is where, for example, a zip or buttons go in or the other way around. So we have buttons in the center front and the closed center back. So this determines where we place our pattern pieces in the cutting process. Usually we cut our pattern pieces according to the grain of our fabric. So the grain of our fabric is the direction in which the thread is going, which is usually basically just a grit on the fabric. So you can see the vertical thread, which is basically lengthwise, and you can see the horizontal thread, which crosses the vertical lines in a perpendicular angle. This is usually how we cut our pattern pieces. There is also another way to cutting pattern pieces, which is in a 45 degree angle to the main grain line. This, for example, can be very useful if you want to create hugging skirts or dresses, something that fits your figure a little bit better because it gives us the maximum stretch of the fabric that we're using. What you want to avoid is to place your pattern pieces in any other way than in a 90 degree angle to the grain line or a 45 degree angle to the grain line because that might affect the fit of your garment in the end. Another term that might be new to you but is very important in sewing is to overturn a piece of fabric. So for example, the blouse that I'm wearing right now, you can see that the collar has the good side of the fabric facing on both the inside and the outside. And that is achieved by sewing two pieces of fabric together and then overturn them at the seams so that the two wrong sides are facing each other and the two good sides are facing outside. It's basically like a fabric sandwich and it's a very, very important technique when sewing. You can overturn, for example, cuffs and blouses, collars, hems, or entire top pieces for dresses if you want to give it a little bit more structure and security. Another important term is lining. So you know what lining is. It's usually an additional layer of fabric on the inside of a dress, a top, a blouse to either make sure it's not see-through or to give it a little bit more fabric so you're not getting cold. It's also the single most effective technique to ensure that your garment is looking beautiful in the inside as well as on the outside because the lining and the shell are usually overturned so that the wrong sides are facing each other and the good sides are facing either the outside world or the inside of your garment towards your body. Now I just mentioned the word shell. The shell is the equivalent to the lining but it's the outside of your garment. So basically your garment consists of the shell which is the outside facing fabric and the lining which is the inside facing fabric.
So there are several different kinds of stitches that you want to get familiar with, especially in the beginning. So the most basic one is obviously a straight stitch. A straight stitch is going to keep your seams together, which means it's going to keep two separate layers of fabric, two separate pieces together with a thread. Your straight stitch can have several different lengths. The length of a stitch depends on what kind of fabric you are using or what your aim is with that seam. If you want the seam to be permanent and you want to keep it where it is, it's always good to just use the basic stitch length of 2.5 on your sewing machine, which is gonna cover almost everything you want to sew. If your fabric, for example, is thicker, less delicate, you don't necessarily have to sew with a 2.5 stitch length. You can also go for a stitch length of 3 or 3.5. If your seam is only semi-permanent and you already know that you want to open it up later, you want to make sure that you use a bigger stitch length, for example, 4.5 or 5. To finish off a seam, it is very important to lock it at the beginning and at the end. To lock a seam, you will simply have to add a few back stitches back and forth to make sure it's not coming loose. If, for example, you want to gather a seam, you will not lock the beginning and the end. You will rather keep it open so you can pick the end of your thread and then gather up the fabric. If you work, for example, with stretchy fabric, you want to use a zigzag stitch. The zigzag stitch is going to allow your seam to expand and contract depending on how stretched the garment is. If you're a beginner, it is very likely that you only own a sewing machine instead of a sewing machine and a serger or an overlocker, for example. If you want to finish your raw edges, you want to, for example, use a blanket stitch, which looks a little bit something like this. This is going to keep your raw edge from fraying. Okay, let's talk about resources to learn sewing. So the first one and the most obvious one since you are here is YouTube. YouTube is a treasure trove of learning videos, tutorials, DIY ideas. For me personally, it's been my go-to source when I started a new project. I usually Google something, but I also YouTube it to find some video resources on it. If, for example, you stumble across a new sewing technique that you don't know how to do yourself, let's say sharing, because this is something that I did for the very first time last year. There are so many sharing videos on YouTube and they will show you exactly step by step how you can recreate this technique on your own garment. There are many many sewing YouTube channels and YouTubers out there but my personal favorites are definitely With Wendy, The Essentials Club, Kularpa, Vintage Thursday and Pattern Love London. In terms of inspiration, inspiration can come from everywhere. It can come from you having a walk on the street and seeing somebody who is wearing something that you really like, but also browsing on the internet. And some really great resources for me have and will probably always be Pinterest. I have many, many boards on Pinterest and I am usually on Pinterest at least once a day to source ideas or inspiration for projects that I'm working on. An additional resource in recent years has become Instagram. There is also functionality in Instagram to save and sort posts so you can make sure that you find what you're looking for quickly. Let me show you which Instagram accounts I'm following for the best inspiration. Last but not least, there are obviously also other social media platforms like TikTok, which is great for quick sewing hacks, but I also always refer back to blogs, especially the blog in the fold is super useful to me when I'm looking for pattern construction tutorials. So let's delve a little bit deeper into pattern construction and where to get patterns from. So again, the internet is full of free patterns and it's also obviously full of patterns that you can buy. I personally don't purchase pattern that much. Um, sometimes I do because I just often find them confusing. <laughs> I'm not very good at reading instructions. Um, I just don't have the patience for it really. So I create my own patterns. And now before I intimidate you with that, I have been sewing for many, many years. I actually went to fashion school as a teenager. And although a lot of that knowledge has since disappeared from my brain, um, I obviously have learned the basic skills that are needed to create my own patterns. However, I'm convinced that you can create your own patterns too. And the key to creating your own patterns is to create a bodice block to your own measurements first. If you're able to create a bodice block for yourself, this is the starting point for most and every other pattern that you would possibly want to create. So for that, I'm going to link a resource in the description box, which again is from the blog in the fold, which has an amazing tutorial on how to create your own bodice block. If creating your own bodice block intimidates you still, there's also the opportunity to trace patterns of garments that you already own that fit you well. I have done this many, many times for trousers, for sweatshirts, for blouses, really anything. If you stick as close to the original as you possibly can, you will be able to recreate that garment from scratch.
All right, so let's talk a little bit about how to source fabrics. I know from experience that getting the right fabrics and also really just entering the fabric store sometimes can be super intimidating because there is so much choice. There's so much choice out there and really choosing the right fabric for the garment you want to make is key to making something that you actually like wearing. And this really does take practice and time to get into. I think the best way to start is to find the area in your town or your region where you can find the most fabric shops. Usually in bigger cities like London, LA or New York, there are actual districts dedicated to fabrics. Here in London, it's for example in Soho, but also in West London, in Shepherd's Bush, there are a lot of fabric shops and then obviously also scattered around the city, but if you're looking for a more dense population of fabric shops, that's the way to go. In Los Angeles, for example, I know that there's the fashion district where you can find many, many different kinds of fabric shops as well. And a quick Google search told me that in New York, there's also the garment district where apparently you can find many different kinds of fabrics. So get to know your town, get to know your surroundings and go to the right kind of places. But then obviously there's also the internet. So it's really easy these days to order fabric online. I often find that this can be tricky because you don't quite know what the fabric ends up looking like in real life. You also don't quite know what it feels like unless you are familiar with the different kinds of fabrics that there are or have better understanding of what different fiber mixes can result in. But Good online fabric shops will give you the opportunity to order swatches, which might take you a little bit longer because you have to wait for the swatch, make your choice and then order the actual amount that you need, but it's also always a good idea. I also want to talk just a little bit about sustainability with fabrics. Sewing in and of itself is obviously a hobby that is all around creating and you produce garments with that, which for many people can be a problem if they are very environmentally conscious. However, there are routes to go if you want to create sustainable garments. For example, dead stock fabrics are always a very, very good choice and they usually are actually a real opportunity because many fabric shops have dead stock fabrics from designers or ex-designers. So you can find the most beautiful, luxurious fabrics for a very, very low price. And by buying dead stock fabrics, you will ensure that those don't land in landfill and are burned. Okay, so last but not least, let's talk a little bit about tips and tricks that I want to give you when you start your sewing journey. So one of my tips would be to learn as you go and learn project by project. I probably think it's better to start your sewing journey by starting a piece that you really want to make, that you are passionate about and that you want to own. This gives you the necessary motivation to stick to it and to see it through. If, for example, you start with, I don't know, pillowcase, <laughs> say. It's obviously a good project to, for example, test out your sewing machine and to get a little bit into sewing a straight seam, but it's probably not going to um, keep you interested for that long. So rather than sewing a pillowcase or like 15 pillowcases to start sewing, you could, for example, start with a very, very simple shift wrap dress that doesn't have any buttons or zips, maybe something without sleeves. So you just sew something that you can in the end put on your body and it kind of works. Maybe pick something that looks easy to make that you can get behind, choose an exciting fabric and start from there. The other thing that I would recommend is to watch other people make stuff before you start making stuff. You probably already do that. You watch YouTube videos and tutorials and watch other people like me or other YouTubers make their own garments. And this is a very good place to start because the more you watch other people handle garments and fabrics and seams, the more you get an understanding of the anatomy of a dress and develop your 3D thinking a little bit. And I think this is a really good place to start. Another tip that I would like to give you is to play a garment through in your head before you start cutting your fabric. Um, I usually use my iPad to draw out a design first. Even if you just sketch it out and it doesn't look like much, you think through the fabric and you think about the different pieces that you need, how they are gonna come together and maybe already think about, oh, I want to overturn this piece or I want to add facing here so that I have a crisp edge. I want to have a circle skirt or a half circle skirt instead of a straight skirt. If you think it through first, you are probably gonna end up with a result that you are gonna like even more. Something that you can also do is draw out your pattern pieces on paper, cut the paper pieces out and then kind of like puzzle them together. That's also gonna help you to get a bit of a better understanding. Another tip is not to get ahead of yourself. Just try to think for a moment and, and have a look at what you want to make and really think about your capabilities and whether you think you are challenging yourself, which is a good thing, 
or you are getting in way above your head, which is not a good thing because you don't want to, you know, waste time and money and resources on buying a fabric and doing something that in the end is really just for the bin. So just try to take a moment before you start a project and really think, is this a good level for me right now? Is this something that I think I can do? Or might it be just a bit too challenging? Something that I also think is important to get in your head is that sewing isn't necessarily something that you can learn in an instance. It's something that you will have to learn over time. You will acquire skills over time. You will acquire a better understanding of fabrics and garments and patterns over time. And the more you make, the better you become. With sewing, unfortunately, it's really about volume. So you have to go through a volume of work to actually create something that you really, really like. Obviously, things like talent and passion also go into this equation. So if you're super talented um, and very, very passionate, you might be faster than other people. But what I can say is that it is really worth it. So no matter if you're super talented or you're really just starting out and you have no clue what you're doing, just stick to it. Stick to it and see where you can go and take it step by step and don't rush through the process. I think rushing through the process is not A, necessary, and B, it's also not gonna get you anywhere because you're gonna get frustrated really quickly. Generally, I feel like with sewing, it's very easy to overestimate what you can do after your first project, and it's really easy to underestimate what you can do in, say, three months' time. It's also totally fine to fail, you know? You have to fail and you have to do things over and over again. I said earlier, try to challenge yourself, but don't overestimate what you can do. You will still fail many, many of the time. <laughs> and that's totally fine. And I think what's important is that you stand up one more time than you fall down. So if you fail with a fabric or with a pattern or with an entire project, do it again, restart. Um, give yourself a little bit of time, get the frustration out and then start again. And I'm sure you will succeed in the second go. Alright, so that has been enough talking. I hope that this video helps you to get motivation, inspiration and the means to actually start your own sewing journey. Don't be intimidated, I know you can do it and I can't wait to see all the things you're gonna make. See you soon! Even if it's just, you know, a scribble, a scribble, 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 a doodle, your stare. If you are a beginner, if you are a beginner, it is very likely that the only...